Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our lesson today. Let's go ahead and get started and uh, as usual I will recommend for you to uh, always take a moment to pause the uh, lesson and read the uh, disclaimer. All right, today on our agenda we have uh, three interesting things that we're going to be talking about. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to begin a detailed discussion on the other time frame trader. We've talked in the past about the day time frame trader and uh, their preferences and the nature of their activities and how to identify it. And today we are going to take a close look at the other time frame trader, their activities and uh, how they influence the market. And certainly they are a, an important part and player in, in the market. Uh, we are then going to talk a little bit about initiative and responsive activity in the market. And we will conclude our discussions today with a look at footprint charts. All right. Before I begin talking about the other time frame trader, let me just review with you uh, the short term or the short time or the daytime frame trader once again uh, to remind you of the distinction between the two. Um, as we've discussed in the past, there are really two key players in the market that we have to keep our eyes on. And if we can determine which of them is really in control of the market, it really helps us as traders to make our trading decisions. So the one that we've talked about in the past has been the day time frame trader or the short term trader. And we identified that their characteristic behavior is they love to be in the value area of the market. They love to trade around fair price. They want an area where there are lots of buyers and sellers because of the nature of the way that they trade. Since they are a daytime uh, frame trader or a short-term trader, they're in and out of the market quickly. So they can't afford to trade on the extremes of the market. They have to trade in an area where there's a lot of two-sided trade because this allows them the flexibility of being able to ease in and out of positions. The daytime frame uh, trading style is one where they will go into the market with a fairly large position, but they're only looking for, if, if in fact we're looking at the ES Mini, they're only looking for one or two ticks in terms of profit. So they get their one or two ticks and they're out. And then they're in again with another trade, one or two ticks and back out again. So they move in and out of the market frequently and that's how they make their profit. And therefore, they're always looking for areas of great liquidity in the market, lots of buyers and sellers. And where do we find these areas? This is really what we usually define as our value area, the area around the point of control, if you will, the fairest price of the day. That's their favorite spot to trade because they know that if they make a trade in this area, it will allow them to come in and out of the market quickly and easily. So this is the characteristic behavior of the short-term trader. Now let's begin and talk about the other major player in the market, the other time frame trader. And we're going to talk about the other time frame trader in two terms, or we're going to use two different types of words to describe the other time frame trader. Sometimes you will hear me describe them as the other time frame trader and other times as the longer term trader. And the reason that we give them the broad name of other time frame trader is because they don't all have the same time frame. Some of them may be looking at a couple of days, some of them it may be a week, two weeks, it just varies all over the place. The idea, the basic idea is that this other time frame trader is definitely looking at a longer period of time for their trading decisions than a daytime frame trader. That's the key difference that distinguishes um, the actions of these two different players. 
the time frame that they look at the market. So let's take a look together now at what are the characteristic behaviors of this longer term trader or the other time frame trader. First I want you to know that this is the trader that actually moves the market. They have the power, the ability, and the wherewithal to create directional moves in the market. So obviously this is also a very important player to be able to detect and identify when there are when they are present in the market and when they are engaged in the, in the market. Their characteristic behavior is really evident in their desire for an advantageous price. Unlike the short term or the day time frame trader that's looking for a fair price, these longer term traders are looking for an advantageous price. They're looking for a good deal, if you will. They want to buy at an incredibly low price so they could sell high and they want to be able to sell at a very high price to make a big profit. So they are always found at the extremes of value. And this is how they're very different from the short time or the day time frame trader. Their perception of value is completely different from the day time frame trader. And because they have the ability to influence the market directionally, they could set a target value and behave according to their own um, targets and they have the, the ability to actually take a, an instrument from one point to the other uh, because of their wherewithal and their ability to participate with a large volume in the market. Now they also have the luxury of time on their side. They can wait for an advantageous price. Unlike the day time frame trader, they don't have to be flat at the end of the day. They don't have to close their positions. They can leave them open for a week, for two, for three. Um, it depends. It's going to vary from one uh, other time frame trader to the next, but they have more flexibility. And so this gives them the ability to really work in the market in a very different way from the short time frame trader. Imagine, for instance, uh, just as an individual, if uh, you needed to buy an item, be it a computer, a, a television, or, or a telephone, or whatever, whatever item that you wanted to buy. And if you had to have it right now, you are probably going to pay more for it. Uh, but if you had the luxury of time, you were not in a hurry, you can wait for it to go on sale, you can uh, wait for it to buy it at a discount. So. Um, when you have more time to make your decision, this gives you an advantage in the market. And long, longer term traders have this advantage in the market. They're always looking for a bargain. Now, how they determine where the bargain is, is really the key. And they certainly do their own market analysis and market studies, and these long term traders identify certain levels in the market where these, these deals are found and when the price hits these points they in fact act uh, upon it quickly and they also can come in to influence the market to drive price into a particular direction that they want so they could either buy or sell. That's how powerful these players are. Alright, so to review again when we look at the profile in general uh, we find that the value area will exist where there are lots of prints, lots of TPOs, and this, this will define for us the area of fair price. So where are we going to see these long-term traders uh, coming into the market at advantageous areas? At the extremes, if you will. So up here, this is the advantageous area for a long-term seller. If they perceive that the price has gone far too, uh, too, uh, too high, now is the time for them to come in as a seller because it's advantageous to sell at this point. And on the other side of the coin, they're looking for the advantageous area to buy. 
And so if price drops to a certain point, they will come in and buy at this point because they will feel like they are getting a deal. So they're always looking for these advantageous areas in the market. And based on our prior discussions, we know that we can identify this always based on where the value area is. If prices are outside the value area, then we know that these are the areas that are going to attract the attention of these long-term uh, or other time frame buyers and sellers. So their objective really, for the long-term buyer, the objective is to buy low and the longer-term seller, the objective is to sell high. They always want this advantage. They, they don't care about fair price. They want to get the best deal possible in the market. Now, do long-term buyers and sellers ever really interact and deal uh, with one another in the market? Interestingly enough, since the long-term buyers and sellers have different objectives, they're often not trading with each other at the same price at the same time. Each of them, ha unlike the short-term trader and the short-term seller, where both of them want to be able to get in and out quickly, see they have a common objective, so we see them both trading around fair price. These other players have different objectives. One of them wants to be able to sell very high, and the other wants to be able to buy very low. And so we will not often see them transacting with one another in the market. However, there are times when in fact they will transact with one another, and I will show you some of, the, some of those instances. The same price can't always be advantageous for both at the same time. So let's review the characteristics of an advantageous price or advantageous prices. These are prices where the market spends very little time. So when the market gets to these points, you will often see price move very rapidly in one direction or the other. Also at these extremes or advantageous prices, we will always find that we are going to be outside the value area. We are either going to be above it or below it. So by definition, if prices are within the value area, they're obviously not advantageous. You either have to be below value or above value to create an advantageous price. Another characteristic of these advantageous prices is they're always or frequently going to be accompanied by low volume. Why is that? Because the short-term trader is not really going to be trading at these extremes. And remember, we talked about that before. They're going to limit their activity to the fair price area. So the minute prices start to, start to move away from fair value and away from the value area, they're going to shy away. And so this is when the longer term player comes into the picture and usually they're able to move the prices very quickly in one direction or another with a fairly low volume because there simply isn't the two-sided trade that takes place, the, the level of two-sided trade that takes place when we are within the value area or around fair price. So advantageous prices are low volume at rejected excess price levels. So in other words, they exist at the extremes of our profile. All right, just as we asked this question before when we talked about the short-term traders, how do we know that it is in fact the longer-term trader that is active at advantageous prices? Why isn't it the uh, short-term trader? How do we know that this in fact really holds true? And the answer is quite simple. Only traders who don't have to trade today can take a chance on making their trades in an area where the market does not spend much time. 
it is very risky for a day time frame trader to start engaging in the market at the extremes because they could really get caught and if the market moves directionally against them they're going to be facing huge losses and remember these short-term uh, frame traders are trading large positions and so when the market goes against them the losses can be hefty so you have to appreciate the fact that to manage their risks short-term or daytime frame traders always like to trade in the value area they want volume they want the crowd they don't want to be out there on a limb all by themselves in an area where there isn't a lot of activity it takes someone very bold to come in and participate in that area of the market all right let's take a look at these three profiles uh, uh, for three uh, consecutive uh, days and let's see if we can in fact uh, identify the behavior of the long-term or the longer-term trader on these profiles first of all let's take a look at this buying tail here in period G the first thing that we notice is period G popped out of the value area you see the low of the value area for the day here right here this was the low for the day and prices started to move lower so what happens the longer term trader steps in and begins to buy immediately creating this buying tail that we see that is the characteristic behavior of the longer term buyer they stepped in now at what point will they step in really there are certain levels and basically we go back to our discussion of support and resistance and they make their decisions based on these levels and their analysis of the market however we can always detect their footprint because as price deviates away from the value area we begin to look at price and see what is going to happen is price in fact going to continue to drop or is someone going to pick up the price and take it back into the value area and in this case sure enough the price was picked up at this level right here and it was brought into the value area now it is always very very important to look at two things when we are analyzing the behavior of these longer term traders the first is to take a look at the period that follows immediately after the first period that broke through the value area and see how prices reacted to that break of the value area and if you notice in this case period H brought us back closer to the value area and in fact it moved right back into the value area so it told us that this longer term buyer was committed to buying and continued to buy and this brought the value right back into the value area by the same token you also want to look at the volume and notice what I talked about just a couple of slides earlier these areas or advantageous price areas are characterized by low volume look at the further away that we move from the value area the smaller and the lower the volume take a look at the area where there's fair price the volume is much greater and this is evident immediately in areas where we get into advantageous prices the volume drops significantly the daytime frame trader runs out of the market this is not an area where they want to be trading uh, they certainly sit this out until 
value comes back into the market. So they're far more comfortable taking a trade at this point in period H, buying along. Now I see the commitment of uh, someone to prices. They think they're advantageous at this point. This is a really good deal, a good point to buy. And sure enough, prices continue to take off and, uh, and go up from this point on. All right, now let's take a look at this next day here. Once again, when do we begin to detect the activity of a longer term buyer or seller? When prices move out of the value area. And sure enough, value again, or prices again, dropped below the low of the value for the day. And certainly, here they dropped below the value of the prior day in period A. So when prices dropped, this obviously long-term buyer came back in on the following day, stepped in and bought and brought them back into value area. Now, look again with me at what happened the second period. The second period, it dropped all the way back down to test the same level where the buying occurred, and it held again. And from that point on, prices continued to the upside because obviously there was a long-term buyer that was committed at these levels that really perceived them to be a bargain. So every time they came down to this area, they were ready to buy. Now, it took a little bit longer here, and so if you notice, the volume was certainly a little bit more than it was on the prior day. Now, why did it take a little bit longer? Because obviously there was another seller and probably a longer term seller that was selling at this, at this point, and, uh, but the buyer was able to eventually overcome. And we will talk in more detail about this phenomena or this type of behavior when we um, talk about initiative and responsive behavior in just a little bit. All right, let's take a look at the third day. Even though prices have moved up quite a bit, take a look here. As soon as prices drop, and now in this case, when prices are dropping outside value area, what is happening is we are really watching a longer term seller in action. But what happened is the same buyer still perceives value to be low at this point, and so they came in and they picked prices and took them back up to the value area. So this buyer that probably started here and here was still committed to a higher level and continued to take prices higher and higher. All right, now let's review again. Whenever we see these tails that define for us the advantageous price areas, we're going to find that they're going to be accompanied by low volume. And once again here, low volume. It's certainly always going to be lower than the volume that we will see in the value area. And no different here, once again, even though technically, in this case, this is a selling tail, if you will. Um, it started selling below value, and then somebody picked it up here, made it a buying tail. It still was an advantageous price outside value, and the volume was fairly low. All right. Now let's talk about a very important concept, and uh, this is a concept that you will not find discussed or talked about in uh, many areas. Actually, a lot of the things that we are uh, talking about here you probably will not hear anywhere else. Um, let's talk about initiative versus responsive activity. And this is very important to also be able to detect because it gives me an idea about the conviction of the actions of this longer term trader. We've already identified that this longer term trader is a very important player and is someone that we really have to learn to detect 
their footprints in the market or their behavior and action in the market. And we now know that it's easy for us to detect when they're there. Just look at these buying and selling tails and low volume area. Anytime we're outside the value area, uh, we're in an at, at an advantageous price and this long term trader is going to step in. But what we want to get at now, which is sort of the nuance of all this, is how committed are these guys? Are they really going to move uh, the market in a specific direction or are they just sort of picking up a little bit here and there? Uh, they really don't perceive it to be a great bargain, um, but just a slightly advantageous price. And this is what helps us to um, determine this by identifying whether their behavior is initiative or responsive. So identifying whether the long-term traders are acting on their own initiative or responding to an opportune price is very important. Are they the ones that are really initiating the move or are they simply responding to something that's happening in the market? And this identification will help us dramatically in understanding their influence in the market and being able to, tr to take trades on their coattails in the same direction that they're moving the market. So follow with me here so you can learn how to uh, detect if in fact it's initiative or responsive behavior and if it's initiative you want to be part of it as quickly as you can be. All right, initiative buying is any buying that occurs within or above the prior day's value area. So by definition, we are going to have initiative buying if the buying is beginning to occur above the value area of the prior day. And the corollary or the opposite of that, initiative selling is any selling that is going to occur within or below the prior day's value area. All right, so we've already identified how we're going to determine initiative selling and initiative buying. The minute it begins to take place um, outside the value areas. Now, initiative activity is important to identify because it gives us an idea about the conviction on the part of the longer term trader. Remember what, what, I, what we talked about a little bit earlier, how these longer term players are very powerful and they're able to move markets directionally. So if I can detect their initiative when they're starting to move the market and I can in fact go in on their coattails, I am really going to make some good money. So this is why it really behooves me to be able to identify this behavior in the market. Responsive activity, on the other hand, is the opposite of initiative activity. Buyers are simply responding to prices below value, and sellers are simply responding to prices above value. So the longer term trader is not really initiating the move. They're not the ones that have decided we're going to take the market up. They're simply sitting there on the sidelines watching the market and all of a sudden they see that uh, there's a good price here so I'll come in and buy a little bit. You will find that if this is the behavior it's responsive it will not be anywhere near as powerful as if it were in fact initiative and quite often uh, traders can get fooled in the market when they make the mistake of identifying responsive behavior as initiative behavior. So you need to really sort of develop the uh, art and science of being able to discern the difference between these two because obviously both of them are going to take place outside the value area. All right, so let's take a look at an example here and see if we can in fact uh, work together to discern uh, which of the two behaviors it is. In this case, Prices started to drop below value area really in period W and then they came back up 
and then period Y. Now notice what is happening here, why this is responsive. Because every time it drops a little bit, the seller comes in and picks it up and brings it back towards, um, towards the value area again. If in fact it was initiative, we would see it continue in the opposite direction. So we have responsive selling and then a little bit of initiative buying. Responsive selling in that when prices start to drop outside of the value area, they are now going into an area where it becomes attractive for the buyer to buy. And all of a sudden when the buyer is buying, the seller is responding. And so we get some responsive selling. And the move up really is not sustained for very, for very long. All right, let's take a look at initiative activity and see what happens when prices in fact begin to move outside the value area. And remember now, where is the first period that prices began to move outside the value area of the prior day? And in this case, on the 14th, we will, if we look closely here, we will see that the, the first print that we got outside the value area of the prior day was really in the B period, if, if, you, if you will. But since the, the value area of these two days are so close, I would look at the C period as the period when we really began to get outside of the top value area of the previous two days. So prices now are starting to move outside value. Is it initiative or is it responsive? Well, since it's beginning the move up, it's certainly initiative. Has it been met with responsive selling? Yes, we did get a little bit of responsive selling. But then what happened? When we got a little bit of selling, it, prices did not deteriorate that far back. They did find support at the top of the value area here. If you notice, period D only dropped one print below the value area. And then prices started coming back up again. But notice, even more importantly, they superseded period C. So now, period D has a higher high than period C. Now remember our definition of an uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. Take a look at period C and where the low was for period C. And then take a look at period D and where the low was for period D. We have a higher high for period, for period D and a higher low. Classic definition of an uptrend. So I have the characteristics of initiative buying. Now, I, if I wanted to, I probably would be very comfortable taking a long position at this point of support here right at above value. And if in fact when D drops down here again, and prints this low and then I see it start to climb back up again, I, this would be a good entry for a long position because I've identified initiative buying. And sure enough, E period continues up and then F period continues up even further and then G goes up a little bit more followed by H, I, J, K and prices continue to move higher and higher. So you see initiative buying is followed by more and more buying in that direction. And value then begins to also expand. The range of value expands beyond the old range. These are the characteristics of initiative buying and this is when I would want to be a buyer. If in fact this initiative buying would have been met with strong responsive selling, it would have brought value right back into the value area. It did not happen in this case, so that's why prices continued to move up. 
All right, now let's take a look at initiative selling and what happened here. Why is it initiative selling? Well, prices started to sell to drop below my value area for this day and for below the prior day as well. So now as prices are dropping, what do we see happening? Initiative selling, but it was met with responsive buying and it brought us right back into the value area again. So if I would have made the mistake of thinking that this was going to continue and shorted at this point, I would have really been hurt as I got met with this responsive selling and prices continued to go back up uh, into the value area. Now you see the response of buying in B in B period. All right, let's take a look at some more examples. First of all, we have initiative buying here that begins in period C above the value area of the prior day. And what happens again? Prices continue higher and higher. Let's take a look at this particular day. When did, when did our initiative um, buying start to take place? The initiative buying actually started to take place when prices were above the value area of the prior day. So at A print, at this point, we were above the value area and prices started to move up quite a bit. And then let's take a look at what happened in B period. B period came back down, tested the same level of support, and sure enough it held. And what happened? Prices did end up moving back up again and the same pattern of an uptrend. The B period had a higher high and about the same low. But C period, on the other hand, um, started to have a higher high but a lower uh, sorry, a lower high, but a higher low. The trend really was not very strong, and sure enough, if you notice, prices were confined to a small value area and did not continue to move the way that we saw them move in this prior area. So you see, initiative buying will not always develop in the same manner. It is all going to depend on what happens in the following periods and what level of responsive selling are we going to encounter uh, to the buying and vice versa. If we have initiative selling, um, what is the level of responsive buying? So let's take a look now at an example of actual initiative selling. When did the initiative selling begin? when prices began to drop lower than the prior day's low value area. And this started very early in the morning and notice what happened. We opened up here right, right a little bit above the POC of the prior day in the value area and prices continued to drop and they dropped below the value area of the prior day all the way to the almost the high of this day's value area. And then what happened? We saw that B period prices came back up, but when they came back up, they couldn't even make it through the low of the prior day. And this gives us a very strong indication that this is initiative selling. The seller in this case, the long-term seller is committed. They're really going to be selling quite a bit. And this would be a good point to begin a trade to take a short or to move with the seller in a downward direction. And sure enough, watch what they do. They take prices even lower and lower, C, C, um, C period goes lower, D period even lower yet, E, F, G, and prices continue to drop quite a bit. And the value area for the whole day is significantly lower than the prior day. So this is when 
there is conviction behind the initiative selling and it has not really been met with st strong responsive buying. The buyer really, the long-term buyer, sort of agreed with the seller. This was not a good time for them to be buying. Uh, the value that they wanted to buy at is probably going to be quite a bit lower and you will see them step into action at some point but it is much lower than where prices are at this point. Now, we try to discern some of this behavior and detect it simply by looking at the profile. However, we have with us another very powerful tool that we should not overlook that will really help us dramatically in being able to identify initiative versus responsive behavior, uh, the level of volume and so on. Actually, it helps us to the point that I call it our x-ray vision, the footprint chart. And I've talked a little bit about the footprint chart in the past and I want to talk a little bit uh, about it a little bit more today and we're certainly going to talk about it a lot because this gives us information that is very valuable and if we learn to interpret it it can tremendously help our understanding of the market and our ability to move in harmony with the market. All right, so the footprint chart is, again, uh, something that we can easily produce um, in the market delta. And tomorrow in our, um, in our lab, uh, I will cover some of this as I did in the earlier uh, labs with some of you. Um, in terms of how to um, get the chart and and the and the change some with parameters and so on, uh, but let me begin with this first basic chart, which is a chart that shows us simple bid and ask. On the left hand side is the number of contracts that were transacted at the bid. On the right hand side is the number of contracts that were transacted at the ask. So at each of these price levels I have x-ray vision. I can actually take a look now and tell you during this period of time, which was a five minute increment, how many transactions, how many contracts were sold at bid and how many were sold at ask. This is very helpful and very powerful information. All right, the bid is on our left side and the ask is on the right hand side. Okay, so bid and ask information. There is a, another feature, these footprint charts can be customized and changed in a variety of different ways. And each way that we customize and change them gives us different types of information that we can use in different ways. And uh, we will look at these different charts and we will use them in a variety of different ways. Uh, I just want to begin introducing the, these basic concepts to you and then we will integrate them into some of the other concepts and, and uh, show how the footprint can really be a great asset in helping us detect early initiative buying, responsive selling, some of these concepts that we're talking about long-term behavior, short-term uh, short trader behavior uh, in, in the market. So the next thing that uh, you need to be familiar with is the concept of the delta and how we calculate a delta. A delta is nothing more than the difference between the number of contracts at bid and the number of contracts at the ask. So if we take a look at these two charts and they're really two charts of the same exact picture but shown in a different manner. On the right hand side the chart is showing me my delta and on the left hand side it is showing me bid and ask. So let's take an example here and uh, pick a uh, number and show how we actually calculate the uh, bid and ask. Let's take a look at this cell here. We have 94 
at bid 206 at ask. So 94 contracts traded at the bid and 206 were traded at the ask. The difference between the two is my delta. If I have more contracts traded at the ask, then I have a green or what we call a positive delta. Again, let me review one of the er very early concepts that we discussed to make sure that you remember it and are comfortable with it. In the auction market, if transactions are taking place more at the bid, this is a indicative of a more aggressive seller. If transactions or more transactions are taking place at the ask, this is indicative of a more aggressive buyer. So therefore, when I look at the bid and ask numbers, and I have 206 at the ask versus 94 at the bid, obviously, in this case, at this price, at this moment of time, the delta was positive, meaning that the buyers were more aggressive in the marketplace. So already, based on the footprint chart, I can take a look at any point, price point in time, and tell you who was the more aggressive at that price. Was it the sellers or was it the buyers? And if in fact it was the buyers that were more aggressive, what is this likely to do to prices in the market? And the answer should be obvious. Prices, we should see prices go up. And take a look at what happened on the following candle. Sure enough, in that five minute time frame, prices did go up. Now, you have to put things in perspective. We don't expect them to, to go up to the moon or you know a huge up move. We're looking at five minute charts. So based on this five minute increment and what we saw in the market, we knew that prices were going to move up probably two or three ticks. And sure enough, they moved one, two, three, four ticks above. So this is where this information becomes very helpful. When I begin to see more aggressive buyers in the market, I know that prices are likely to continue to move in an upward direction. On the other hand, when I begin to see that in fact it's the bidders or it's really now the sellers that are becoming more aggressive, the, uh, that more prices are or more is selling at the bid relative to what is selling at the ask, prices are going to decrease. So you begin to see the power of the data that the profile can provide to us and how this this can be tremendously helpful in our analysis and it is not about either or it's really about using the power of both together the profile along with the delta or the footprint the footprint charts now there is also another indicator, which we talked about before, which is called the volume breakdown indicator. And this shows us visual, a visual representation of the actual delta for each time bar. So in this case, we had a big positive delta. And sure enough, prices went up. In this case, we had a negative delta. And sure enough, prices went down. So these help us to visually see what is happening in the market. All right, so the delta that you see down here is for the entire bar, not for any one specific cell. The calculation that we did was just for each cell, not, not for the entire bar. Although, when we look at the foot, uh, foot price, uh, footprint price statistics, the software is also able to calculate it for the entire bar. Now, sometimes we're going to get an interesting phenomena, which we call the delta diversions, where in fact, 
uh, prices will be moving lower, but the delta will be higher. And often the, the delta will win out and you will see prices move up a little bit. All right, another way that we can display and look at the um, footprint chart is the bid and ask volume. And in this case, what we wanted to highlight rather than the delta is the total volume at each price and highlight it with a color. So if the volume was positive, it would give us a green. If the volume was negative, it would be red. And the purpose here is it'll highlight for us which volume was predominant in the bar. So in looking at this particular bar, selling was certainly dominant. And the next question we want to look at is where was the biggest volume? Was it at the top or at the bottom of the bar or in the middle? And if it is in the middle, then we know that we have two extremes and we want to sort of see where the middle of the next bar is going to be. Is it going to be above the prior, the, the, basically the value area for the bar, or is it going to be below it? As the value area starts to move up, prices will move up. If the value area for the bar moves down, you're going to see prices continue to move down. So you, you will see now a wide variety of ways that we can use and display these footprint charts. The nice thing about being able to take a look at uh, volume uh, footprints like this is it can also show us points where volume starts to dry up. These are in essence the extremes in this time period and notice how we're getting zeros. No bidding at all, just some people picking up buying at the ask. So volume is drying up at this price level up here. But we're getting more volume at the lower prices of the range. This is indicative of value moving lower in the market. Now, another way that we could look at the footprint is to completely do away with bid and ask and just look at pure volume numbers. And notice what the software does for us. It gives us different shading for different levels of volume. The greater the volume, the darker the color. So this is showing me where the greatest participation of traders is in this bar. At what price? Are they buying at the high of the bar? Or, or, or are they transacting at the highs? Or are they transacting as the low? Where is market facilitating trade? Is it on the upper end of the range or the lower end of the range? When I am able to see a picture of this, I am able to discern whether in fact prices are going to be moving up or moving down. Where is the volume? Watch the volume. Where is the volume in the range? Now in this case, uh, this is a period really of very low volume uh, and you can see that down here on the volume chart um, so we're not looking at any anything uh, of great significance. Now we can also do bid ask volume shading. So in this case we don't want it to tell us was it buying or selling volume we just want to see the magnitude and the level of volume but instead of showing us just one number for the entire volume at that price level, I still want to see the bid and ask, but, in, but now in terms of representation of the magnitude of volume. I'm interested in looking at which way is volume moving. Are they moving again upward or downward in terms of trading volume? All right, last but not least, we also have a footprint profile that we can actually create using our footprint charts. And this is a visual representation that is the same as 
our actual profile that we look at with the TPOs. But instead of TPOs, the footprint chart shows it, shows it to us with just bars. So it's the same thing. You see where the value area is. And in this case, because this is really, again, a very short time frame, we don't get a good picture of the profile. But on the next slide, we should get a more representative, a representative picture of what a profile would look like. Again, as with every profile, and you will see this in every single candle, every single time frame. Now, on this chart, we went to a higher time frame, a 30-minute time frame. So it's a more representative uh, profile. Look here again as to what is happening. The extremes, low volume, whether it's at the bottom or the top, and the value area is in the middle of each of these time periods. So each of these bars that you're looking at is a column of TPOs on the actual profile chart. So you're actually able to see a profile of the profile, if you will or a profile within the profile. And take a look at how volume and value is moving in this case. It is not hard to see from this footprint chart that value is moving lower. Take a look at this, lower. And again, here we started to get a little bit different picture. We're getting what we call a double distribution. We haven't talked about that yet, but we certainly will where we have two areas of value in this, um, in this particular time frame or in this, in this period. But you can see the many uses and the versatility of this footprint um, capability that we have in Market Delta. And in our lab, again, as we did in the previous labs, uh, we are going to talk about how to generate and customize many of these charts so we, begin, we can begin using them and applying them in our trading. I have just a quick snippet here of a little video that I will share with you to show you how we can work with both in tandem. On the right hand side we have our profile chart and on the left hand side we have our footprint chart. This column represents 30 minutes and this column also represents the beginning of 30 minutes. So what you really see here are period C and period B right before it. And I just wanted to give you a visual of how the two work in tandem together. So take a look at the video. Let me get the video going here. And watch that as prices are changing on the profile, when we only look at the profile, we're only looking at the letters. But here, I am actually seeing what is physically happening in real time at every print that takes place on the chart. Now, I'm going to draw a horizontal line here at this support level that we have on the uh, profile chart because it's the low value area of the prior day and immediately this gives us a recognition that this is a point of support and we want to see what's going to happen as prices approach uh, this point. Actually this line represents uh, the low of the initial value area here. So I can use the two in tandem. Another interesting feature about these footprint charts is you can actually put other indicators on the footprint chart. So it really helps us to augment and supplement the, the information that we get from the profile itself. The, uh, the footprint gives us what I call the x-ray vision into what is actually happening in each of these prints as they print. Where is the activity here? And if you notice in period C, we're confined, we're still confined to a very tight value area and most of the value is just in these two prices here. And uh, if, uh, if we looked a little bit closer, you will see that most of the activity or the, the greater portion of the activity is really on the bid side, indicating that there's still quite a bit of selling pressure in the market. 
We will look at many more examples of these, uh, but I wanted to begin to introduce you to the ability to work with the footprint chart in tandem with the profile chart, because you will find that that will be a great asset for you in your trading. And it looks like with that we have uh, come to the conclusion of our lesson for today.